You're listening to Give Me The Fear, the Britflix podcast, Fright Fest 2023 preview series. My name is Stuart Ray, and usually I host this show. But for this genre talent film build up to the Woodstock of Gore, I'm keeping stumped. When this intro is done, this is the last you're going to hear from me until I ask you to tell your friends all about it. The spoiler free interviews are brief, and across the entire series, you will discover the kind of knowledge and experience about how to make horror films that they just don't teach you at film school. Are you ready for that? After looking back at the blood, sweat, and tears that went into their creative successes, I asked them one last question. If you could handpick one person to be in the audience, alive or dead, famous or personal to you, for your fright first screening, who would it be and why? I think you're going to love the answers this question elicits. I certainly do. That's my introduction over with. Let's hear from the talent. Hello, my name is Zelda Adams and I am one of the directors, uh, cinematographers, writers, and actors in our movie. But we're a family, so we all kind of do it. I'm Toby Poser. I'm another director, actor, the producer, writer. The uh, stew cooker. (laughs) Stew burner. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Lulu Adams, and I'm part of the crew and the actors. I'm John. I'm dad. I'm friend. I'm, uh, yeah, part of this crew of crazy people, and I love it. Where the Devil Roams is about a family of sideshow performers on the dying carnival circuit in Depression-era America. When something terrible happens to the parents, it's up to Quiet Eve to put back the pieces of her family. It's kind of a cross between Bonnie and Clyde. Um, the Grapes of Wrath and Frankenstein. Oh my God, she nailed that shit! <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap! I so love it. Like, no one else saying it. Just, <laughs> just send a recording of that story because that's the fucking one right there. That was great. Pre production. What's that? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's- well, pre-production, there is a great, I'll just share a story from pre-production. So when we were on the, the uh, festival circuit for Hellbender, we just started hitting every single thrift shop, secondhand store we could find, starting to collect tchotchkes and um, clothing that we could use for Where the Devil Roams for the 1930s. And it was fun just driving across America, particularly middle America, has great secondhand stores and just collecting our arsenal of wardrobe for the, we had a really big cast for this one, the carnival. I got a good one. We were just wrapping up our kind of tour of Hellbender and we had had such a great time, all of us together. And we were driving to the city with Zelda and she was go, about getting ready to go to college at that time. And she turned around and said, hey, before I go to college, do you think there's time to just squeeze in one more movie? <laughs> and so we did. One of my favorite memories from shooting this movie is one of the war scenes. Um, it's with it, one of the actors is my boyfriend, actually, in real life. and. Something pretty violent happens to him by the hands of my dad in real life and in the film. And it's it's very, very funny because when anyone asks, oh, you know, John, how did you deal with your, your daughter's first boyfriend? He can honestly say that he cut off his head. <laughs> with a rusty saw. <laughs> And then I leave it at that and people just look at me like, I can't tell whether this guy's for real. (laughs) Uh, One of my favorite ones was some people were coming to film us doing our thing. And, you know, we wanted to look all cool, want to look like we know what we're doing. And that day, this old car that we were using is broken down. We just can't drive it. We can't get it on the road. Done. We're like, fuck, we got to deal with this real quick and look really cool. 
And so John and I grabbed some dead branches on the floor and we would run them across the windshield. So it looked like the reflection it was driving and we twist them so they look like different branches as you run back and forth again and again. <laughs> and then I would sit on the back hood of the car to bounce it irregularly like they were driving down the road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was the most janky. It was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> yeah. The the 31 Chevy was uh, one of the big stars, maybe the biggest stars of the movie. And she had a lot of attitudes. Sometimes she liked to work. Sometimes she didn't want to work. But she was always beautiful and always natural. <laughs> well, it was um, really fun getting to work with Lulu, who was here for a brief time in between her wanderings all over the world. I think it was right before she was offered to Korea. and. Um, and so there's a scene without spoiling too much where we had to position a shard of mirror so that you could see both my face and Lulu's refre- reflection in the mirror, which was was tricky, but but succeeding was one of my favorite shots in the movie. The last scene in the movie was we didn't know what the last scene in the movie was going to be until we were almost done. We like to shoot and then edit, shoot, then edit. So the the movie was kind of edited um, as we near the end of shooting. And uh, we weren't sure what the last scene was, but when we realized what it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a cinder block fell out of the sky. And Zelda did not want to be um, present for that shoot. How's that for a teaser? (laughs) I would love to see Boris Karloff out in the audience for Where the Devil Roams because I think he would have a huge laugh at what we did with the Frankenstein idea. I would love to have Norma Desmond, well, the character Norma Desmond, um, from Sunset Boulevard, uh, when she walks down the stairs and she's very dramatic and she says, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. DeMille. Well, that was kind of like our Chevy. Our Chevy, our 31 Chevy was our little diva. And I think um, there were a couple other divas in, in, the, in the making in the film. And so I would love to see what a real diva would think of our strange little Carney Sideshow Act. If I were to have someone in the audience, I would want it to be Mia Goth, just because I think I have a girl crush on her and because I think she's the new queen of horror. She's an amazing actress. And I think her presence just in the room would mean a lot to me. And then I would try to go up to her afterwards and cast her in our next movie. (laughs) Genius. I would love to have Julia Ducournau at our films, just to have her opinion and to be in her presence. <laughs> My name is Quax. Uh, I am a French uh, filmmaker and an author. Um, I used to be. Uh, I used to work also as a as a painter and a photographer, but that was in a, in another in another time. Um, I am uh, the author and the film director of uh, Pandemonium. Pandemonium is also my second feature film, and I've directed uh, All the Gods in the Sky uh, a few years back. So Pandemonium deals uh, about the character of Nathan, and uh, Nathan is uh, waking up from a car crash in the middle of a deserted road, and slowly uh, but surely he is starting to understand that he didn't make it, that he's actually dead. And uh, he will have to face the consequences of his past action, and he will have to go to hell. Uh, unfortunately for him, well, it's, it, it doesn't fit uh, his uh, his plan. That doesn't fit his plan at all. And he it, it thinks it's a huge injustice because he didn't do any wrongdoings. Well, that's what I think. But that's not the way it goes. So he has to go to hell. And uh, in hell, he will, have, he will be condemned to, re, uh, to relieve the sufferings of the souls that he's going to run across. And um, on this journey, he will have to find a way to um, escape his condition and pretty much trying to find a way to escape hell. 
the script development, well, uh, script development, it really, it, 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 the process was a little bit um, weird because at that time I was uh, working on a film uh, uh, script, on a film project that was developed with a production company. And we had so many problems with that script. I was working on that script for three years and it was going back and forth. And there were so many advice and so many ideas and so many people going on to the script that I, I hate working like that. I'm a loner when I, when I write. And that time it was it was too many people involved, and I really needed to take a break because I I was feeling lost uh, on on that project. So I I took a break. I said that's it. I'm I'm going to retire from that project for a few months, and I will return after that. But on that period, I wanted to go back to the roots of what gave me um, the of what um, make me want to become a filmmaker. And uh, so I, I really went back to that route, and I wanted to have a total freedom of creativity, and that's what really I that's what that's what take place, and that's what I, I gave it to me. Uh, and um, so, so the process of, of, of writing was uh, was also a little bit strange because it took place during uh, during confinement. Uh, so it was really um, a, a very, actually a very pleasant time to 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 go into uh, writing and to have this creative uh, period because. You didn't have anything else to do, and you were not polluted by other ideas or people calling you or parties going on. And da, da, da. There was nothing, so it was it was just a bless actually for me. Uh, this little parenthesis uh, to uh, to work on that on that script development and to be able to write Pandemonium. Ooh, so we have a few there um, about uh, shooting the movie. Uh, well, when, when you see the first scene of the the first uh, quarter of the of the of the movie, you you see that. Uh, this scene is really taking place into uh, a, a very huge snowstorm, um, which we actually never planned because we were shooting in the in the middle of spring in a place where it's supposed to be like sunny and 20 degrees. But for some reason that we didn't really masterize and understood, it went back to minus 15 degrees with 140 kilometers wind. And the most incredible storm, uh, snow snowstorm that we that the people that was living in that place ever seen in their life. They told us that like in a hundred years that never happened. Uh, so we were not ready for that, and we were all going there with t-shirts and you know and shorts, and you just say, yeah, you know, it's gonna be all, all good weather. And it was not. So it was a, a pure nightmare to shoot that part because we were all freezing to death. And at some point, a firefighter had to come up up the mountain to 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 take us back because we couldn't move anymore. There was so many sto- snow and snow, many ice, and so we, yeah, we, we <laughs> I nearly lost the team a few a few times, and they wanted to go on strike. You know, say that's it, we're not shooting anymore because it's too cold. And I was really freaking out um, big time. Uh, at the beginning of the shooting, we we, we start because the, the shooting took a long time. Actually, it took like nearly two years of shooting, and uh, we started we started production in uh, 2020, um, where um, um, because at tw- in 2020 I didn't actually finish writing the script. I just wrote the first part of the script. So we started in production right there, and it was the beginning of COVID. And uh, uh, one of the guy in the team went to China to film a, a, a TV commercial there, and he went back. And we were the first to have actually COVID in France and in Europe. It was us on that shooting because that guy was one of the first who came back uh, in Europe with COVID. So all the team got sick, and uh, we didn't know actually where it was at that time, and so we didn't really. La, la, la. Then we got all the tests, and then it happened to be COVID. So uh, yeah. So it's, it was rocky. It was a rocky production, but it was very uh, interesting and very wild. The edit of the film also uh, took place in a very distant way because I was editing um, my vision of the film in Paris, and my uh, my uh, editor was in um, in um, in Taiwan. So uh, we were working between Paris and Taiwan, and uh, we were so exchanging uh, um, the ideas and uh, the, the the way we were seeing the movie. So and at the end we 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 combine our bo- two works and that's that's how it become uh, actually pandemonium. But uh, the post production was also uh, quite uh, very difficult because because of that storm, that snowstorm, I couldn't shoot all the shots that I wanted to shoot actually, and there was many things that I couldn't do it because uh, what what was supposed to take one hour took four hours every day. 
So, it, 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 so I had to a lot of things has to be done in post production, and uh, so I had a deal with a, with a studio for the VFX. We were supposed to have like ten to fifteen VFX at the beginning, and we ended up with more than two hundred. So they were quite like whoa, they, they, they didn't know what was going on, and that they had such an amount of work coming up because um, because of the condition of the of the of the shooting. And uh, so it was a very, also a very intense post-production. And, uh, but I think we, we did great with what we had. And I'm, well, well, I think we're all pretty happy with the result. So if I could have uh, one person in the audience, uh, either live uh, or dead, that would be uh, El Maestro uh, Lucio Fulci. Because uh, Lucio Fulci, I, you know, I really took uh, a tribute, I, well, I, I gave a tribute actually to Lucio Fulci in my depiction of hell because he was really inspired by his vision of hell from the beyond uh, that he shot in 1981, if I recall well. Uh, and uh, that was actually the second film that I saw in my life. Uh, the first one uh, being Bernard and Bianca. I don't know if that's the title in English, but it's a Disney movie about uh, two birds. And that was very nice. And the second one was right away, it was Beyond. And that really blew my mind. And I remember at the time when I saw that film, I said to myself, that is exactly what I want to do with my life. I want to tell a story like that. And as I said before, when I... I, I, I wrote the script. I wanted to get back to the roots of what want, gave me the essence of uh, wanted to be a filmmaker. So that's really one of the person that 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 gave me this passion. And uh, so I sort of signed the contract that I did with myself when I was a child, saying, you know, it's like this. This is exactly what I need to do with my life. And this is one of the person that really inspired me at the time. So I wish uh, it could be there and I would uh, love to tell him how much I, uh, I love this work and uh, how much he inspired me. And that's where I am. That's why I am here right now, probably a little bit because of him. I am Jen Wexler and I am the director and the co-writer of The Sacrifice Game. Uh, the Sacrifice Game takes place in 1971. It's about two teen girls that are forced to stay with their teacher at their boarding school over Christmas. And on Christmas Eve, a gang of cult killers arrives at the school with some diabolical plans and the girls must fight to survive the night. Um, so regarding script development, uh, my husband and I worked on the script during covid and um, it kind of, it was a creative project that emotionally helped us get through being indoors all the time. Um, and it's certainly not a COVID movie, but I think that when you watch it, you can see some thematic resonances about, you know, feeling stuck and wanting to escape. The sacrifice game uh, takes place at a boarding school mostly, and the setting of the school is like a character in the movie. So finding the right location was incredibly important. And I was connected with, um, through my producer on the Ranger, Heather Buckley. She introduced me to producers, Phil Kalen and Albert Malamed uh, out of Quebec. And I went to Quebec and did a location scout and we went to a bunch of schools, but they brought me to this old abbey, this old monastery called Oka's Abbey, like about a half hour outside of Montreal. And it was just like such a magical place. I felt like I could like feel the magical energy just from, from stepping onto the property. And ultimately it worked out. We got to shoot there and we got to take over the monastery to shoot the movie. and you know, except for one day we were shooting on this property. So for anybody who's uh, made a movie, you can understand the value of getting to come back to the same location every day and uh, getting to have all your equipment there, getting to have all your production offices there, not having to constantly been on the move, which I've, which I've had to do on other productions. Um, and also what was so special about this place was there's so many different looks, like so many different rooms. So that's really important to me when making a movie is to keep the eye um, entertained. And if you do return to a location, like 
How can we change up the location that makes sense for this part of the story? What is that location's little story arc? Does that develop in any kind of way? So you can see when you watch the movies, some the lighting changes based on where we are in the character journeys. Uh, the lenses that we choose are different and whatnot. And on top of all of that, <laughs> it might have been a little bit haunted, this monastery. I didn't experience anything personally, but um, my producers saw a bunch of candles, like candlesticks just fall down by themselves when they were having a meeting in like a side room. And then some of our crew said there were like weird noises and weird lighting when they were like doing some work in the basement. And uh, I didn't personally experience anything, but I was like so deep in my headspace for, you know, shooting the movie. I feel like I was like, not letting any of the ghosts in. I was like, stay out of my headspace, ghosts. I just want to focus on the movie. So making a movie uh, is all about the details at every stage of the process. So when we were in post-production, on our last day of picture lock, um, we ha- literally had one last sequence to finesse and we like had to get our picture lock cut in. And we found a beat that to me makes the movie. And it was like what, just one of those discoveries that I feel are part of like what makes filmmaking so magical. Um, and it was just this last sequence that we were like, it doesn't quite work. And then finding it with like hours before we had to turn in the cut. Uh, so when thinking about whether there might be one person in the audience, alive or dead, um, that I could have in the Fright Fest screening, I actually don't feel that there's a specific person. However, I was a lonely teenager and um, then I discovered horror movies and they became kind of a best friend for me and they inspired me creatively and helped me to find myself and eventually led me to discover this incredible uh, community of horror fans, um, some of whom became my best friends and now creative collaborators. And I just hope that the sacrifice game can do that for other teenagers that might be going through a hard time and just give them some comfort that what they're feeling now isn't forever and that eventually they will find their people. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with at least one friend. Put a link out on social media, rate and review it for your preferred podcast platform. Put an ad in Lou, Novel the Town Crier, Whisper in the Ear of the Town Gossip. You get the picture. It all helps bring new people into the Britflix podcast form. Thank you. <laughs>